Well, when I was thinking what Father was saying for us today, um, the exciting thing was he reminded me, you know, that we had talked last week about 40 and Mm -hmm. why that was so important. And then I've had all kinds of people come all week and say, I'm glad you did your 40, (laughs) you know, because it was like, you know, you never really know when you do things what, what the impact is. Because most people don't give you tons of feedback. And so you never really know, did I impact? Did I not impact? Was this worth it? Should I have tried harder? You know, whatever. And I think that's often how we feel with the Lord. Because we feel like we're doing our part, but we're like, is he happy about that? Right. You know, did he, what's the deal with that? And so in this season, I think it's interesting, Linnell, that you got that amazing word. Because it is, this is the season, and let me, let me give it to you the way he, he gave it to me, even this morning. <clears throat> In my prayer time this morning, he was reminding me that my soul, my soul, often tries to protect me from my spirit. Okay, now think on that for a minute. Because my soul thinks it knows the truth. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. And so there are pieces sometimes of our soul that will actually not let the Spirit bring the revelation of God to us. Mm -hmm. And so he was having me this morning deal with another piece inside of me that he revealed to me saying, this is something that blocks you. It actually sits within your heart and it becomes a hardened heart, an unteachable spirit. It becomes something that you're not aware of because it's you. It's in your soul. So you're not even aware that you are having this struggle, okay, or that things are being blocked from you. So a lot of people, when I talk about ascending to God and being in his presence, they'll say, I don't have that. I can't get to that, or I don't understand that. And what I would remind you of this morning is, ask Holy Spirit to reveal to you, is there something in my soul? Mm -hmm. Something in my soul that is saying, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to do that. You know, in my case, I can look back and see those beginning things. One of them was Holy Spirit. I had been trained in a denomination that you needed Holy Spirit for conviction of sin, and that was it. So unbeknownst to me, my soul had basically created this barrier or this protection, if you will, from anybody that tried to tell me different. Mm -hmm. anybody that tried to tell me different and so every time somebody would you know do that I'd go "Mm, well I know about that okay Uh, you know I've been trained but I've read the word about that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and so for years from 12 to 30 I was without the true interaction of Holy Spirit with me because I had that protection barrier that thing that really kept me from grasping, oh my goodness, how do you do it without the Holy Spirit? You know, I look at it now and I'm like, I don't know how you do it without, I mean, I've watched people grieve. And if they don't have God, it's a whole different level of grief. With God, it's horrible. With God, it's bad. But without God, it's just yeah, horrid. It's just really, really hard. <clears throat> so this morning... As I was preparing for this, God was saying to me, as I teach today, I'm just going to challenge you to ask Holy Spirit to show you inside your soul, is there something in me? Because he had me get rid of another piece this morning even. Um, Saying, this piece is keeping you from understanding what I'm about to do. What the future is about to be. Because there's parts of you that don't want to know. It says, you know, this is a little too scary here. Let's just, 
you know, I just rather didn't know this and, you know, I'll stop listening to everybody and <laughs> I'll just be in my own little bubble and, you know. <clears throat> and he said, there's a piece of you that I need to get rid of that has kept your spirit from giving you all the intel. So just think on that for just a minute. So <clears throat> as we go through the teaching this morning, it'll make more sense because so many times, you know, you read the word, you get a great revelation, Holy Spirit begins to give you those things, and somewhere in our head, we just stop right there. We just stop with that. And if we could ever get the probable understanding of that may be 10% of what the whole thing is, but we think, feel like we've got a hundred because it's more than we've ever had. And so it just feels so good that, you know, we're like, well, this is good. Let's just sit here. But in climbing up the mountain of God, there is no city. Okay. It's, it's our spirit is allowed the ability and the freedom to keep going up. To keep going up. Mm -hmm. And so... We know that the battle is in our mind. We know that the battle to advance the kingdom of God has to be overcome first in us. You know, you can be the greatest declarer on the world, but if you don't believe it in your heart, it's nice, fluffy words, <laughs> clanging symbols. It's exactly right. <clears throat> so, because we just finished the eclipse Monday, you know, there are so many prophets out there and evangelists and people that have given us all this stuff. And it goes from the gamut of we're going to have rapture tomorrow, okay, <laughs> <clears throat> because of the eclipse. Or we should have had it on the eclipse. I don't know what they're saying about today. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But it goes from that to the ones who say it means nothing. Okay. It goes from one into the other. And I'm not trying to justify or do anything. And like I tell people, there's eclipse happening all over the world all the time. The part being is God specifically said that dark suns and things like blood moons would be signs. They would be signs. The question becomes whether you have these barriers out of your soul enough, you can hear the signs. You can do the things. And so let's start with <clears throat> what Jesus would do. Every single evening, because the day started at sunset, mm -hmm. every single evening, he would go away from his uh, disciples for whoever the congregation, whoever the crowd of people were. He would go away and he would spend time with his father. Okay. Now we're assuming we spend time with our Heavenly Father, so it's kind of like Jesus spent time with His Heavenly Father. But it's not on the same plane. <clears throat> it's not in the same dimension. Because you remember the transfiguration? Okay. When He showed His two disciples um, that transfiguration, it wasn't, wow, this is the first time this has ever happened. It wasn't, uh, oh my Look, Jesus just opened up another miracle portal. Okay. Jesus was literally allowing them because he felt that they were advanced enough that they could see what they should be and would be doing. Totally different. He was saying to them, every day you have the ability to part this stuff and step from this natural realm into this spiritual realm, just like this. And you have the ability, when you do that, to be in the presence. You remember who was in there with him? Moses and Elijah. Now, I always ask, how the heck did the guys know that it was Moses and Elijah? Yeah. There were no signs, there were no pictures, okay, no name tags. Okay, how did you, how did you know? Well, that's Elijah. Okay, there was no visual images. It's because when you step into the spirit realm, the knowing comes. You see, on this side, we don't have the knowing. 
That's why we have to step into the spirit realm to get the knowing. Mm -hmm. And so when they did, it was like, oh my goodness, you know. Mm -hmm. And But notice, they responded out of their knowledge of their soul about what do you do when you see this kind of a miracle? Oh, we make a statue. We make an altar so that we can say, we, we were, this is, you know, a big deal. And you know, Jesus is like, okay, you're not getting it yet. You're not getting it yet. So what we're going to have to do to be able to do these next things is we're going to have to be able to have the ability, just like Jesus did, which you already have, FYI. You already have that ability, but your soul tells you you don't. Your soul tells you that's nuts cakes. That's craziness. And you're more intellectual and you know more of the word. You don't want to be fooled or led by crazy people. Okay. So... We have to stop the barriers in our own selves first. And we have to literally give Holy Spirit permission to say, whatever's keeping me from being like Peter, who was not getting it at all, mm -hmm. and didn't understand Jesus was showing him, this is what you'll be able to do every day. Mm -hmm. This is how you will be able to overcome the world. Because when you come into the spirit realm, I can show you what's about to happen. I can give you the understanding and the tools and the resources. I can create those miracle working things in you in an everyday thing. I can give you food you don't have knowledge of. I can give you bread. I can give you water. I can give you life. Okay. And not on this side. But on this side, where you're coming. So, for us to navigate where we're going to be, the Holy Spirit's really pressing and saying, you know, yes, you love the Father. Yes, you love Jesus. Yes, you love the Son. Nobody's questioning that. It's your interaction with them on the level that Holy Spirit is wanting you to have and letting your soul not keep you from doing it. Okay. That's big. Okay. That's big. And you won't, you won't think that because we all think we're doing pretty good. And in my case, I kept saying, I am so much better than I was. You know, I, that's where I go. I get to the next level or plateau or something. I think, okay, we got this. You know, I'm, I got this. And he's like, <laughs> if you'll just let me keep growing you and let me keep exposing to you, you'll get to that place. <clears throat> so... One of the things that you've heard a lot of prophets talk about the eclipse, and like I said, they're, they've predicted a lot of things, but we've also heard several of the prophets talk specifically about the next two years. And one of the prophets that I've always followed because I just can see the accuracy of what he prophesies, and that's Chuck Pierce. And so his accuracy is so amazing. And I think, you know, if he ever really told everybody what he's getting, we'd probably all be so blown away we couldn't even understand it. But that's one of his things, is he will only tell um, what he hears as a prophecy if the Holy Spirit gives him permission. Mm -hmm. So he gets a lot of things, sees a lot of things. He even confesses that. He says, you know, I don't, sometimes I'm allowed to tell my leadership Sometimes I'm not even allowed to tell them. And he says, he, he showed him years ago to get the vision, get the understanding, and then ponder it like Mary did. Because he said, you don't have the fullness of it or you don't have all of it. And so some things he's held for years, years and years. Some he's allowed to give out, some he's, he goes to different places, but he's so aware of the fact that he has to be responsible just because he got a word doesn't mean he gives it. And that's a big thing you can tell in mature prophets and immature prophets. Immature prophets are like those people that just stand up in the middle of a congregation and start speaking in tongues when it's totally incorrect place to do it. 
but they can't control themselves. Okay, that's what they'll say. I can't control myself. Well, that's not true. Okay, we can all control ourselves. <clears throat> but, so he says, he talks about that. Chuck had a vision many, many years ago. And in this vision, God gave him specific things that would be happening up till 2026. And so everybody says, so you're saying the rapture's coming at 2026? He goes, no, no. I'm saying this vision that he gave me, gave me specific things that would happen up till 2026. So if you listen to what he's saying to you today, you will hear that he is saying this. He's saying that America will have to determine its path by 2026. Okay. And he's saying that by Passover of 2026, it will have been and had made a decision. So that's two years. Okay, that's two years. So, in other words, America's going to have to choose. It's going to have to make a decision. It's going to have to decide. And what we've all seen is the amazing evil. Is that not a, you know, it's like the corruption, the, you know, everything that you see, you're just like, really, is nobody seeing this? Or, or you know, what what is the deal? I mean, how can we go along with, you know, who, the World Health Organization, transgendering all your children? I mean, how can we just, oh, well, let's be on excited about that. But what happens, and I want you to understand this, what happens is most people's soul is not enlightened enough by their spirit. They can't even see this is going on. Okay, it's like blocking them. Like, you just take care of yours. You can't take care of all these people. You're just one person. You can't, you can't make a difference. You're just one person. So their souls, there is something, and I call it the weight of sin. Okay. We've all talked about the teaching that I do about, you know, forgiveness, sin, forgiving sin. And what I talk about in John 20, 23, that was the very first instructions Jesus gave to his disciples after they got born again. Because in John 20, it talks about him coming into the room. It talks about him uh, telling them to be calm, be peaceful. It's just me. He was bringing this new dimension. He was bringing this new kingdom in, which they had never had exposed except for the transfiguration and a few things like that. And he's saying to them, uh, be still. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on them. And the word breathe right there in John 20 is only used one time, that particular word, in all the New Testament. It's only used one time in the Old Testament. And the place in the Old Testament it's used is when God breathed into Adam Mm -hmm. and gave him new life. This is the similar thing in the New Testament. Jesus is breathing into his disciples, and that's when they got born again. They did not get the Holy Spirit, you remember? Mm-hmm. He was, he, but this is why. He had to work for the next 40 days, getting them to shift their soul thinking. Because their soul thinking was he was bringing the kingdom to rescue them here. Mm-hmm. They could not grasp he was bringing a better, higher, more important kingdom. Mm-hmm. Because what's more important than keeping me from being under this oppression. This is where you and I are now. People see our America and they're seeing, you know, why are we not being rescued? What what is not happening here? What is what is not happening? Why 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 is Jesus not coming and killing the Romans? Okay. You get it? Why is he not coming and killing the whoever? (laughs) The point being, he had to spend those 40 days shifting their souls. Shifting the things that had been taught and trained to them by 
religious mindsets and by all they've even seen. They've been in Bible school for three years. Okay, three years watching miracles and all this stuff. And somewhere in their head is like, well, we know you're the son of God, so we know you can do miracles. But even when he sent them out two by two and said, you will do the miracles, they did. And they couldn't believe it. But again, they could only comprehend he's doing it. He's giving us this somehow power to do it. Okay. But he's, we're not understanding that at some point he's restoring us back to God so that we go straight to the Father because of this new portal, this new way he's making. So the next part he did after he breathed on them and they got Zoe life, they're now into this new kingdom. Those men were the first restored back, if you think of it. They were restored back to the Father God. So that had to change a lot of things. But he spent 40 days, 40, 40, 40, 40 days. And I say this a lot. <clears throat> we studied last week about um, understanding what he was saying. But 40 literally means... It speaks of transformation. Somewhere you've got to write this down and get it in your head. Transformation and completeness through testing. It didn't say transformation and completeness because you're a good person. It says through testing. So he's spending these 40 days with these disciples. 40 days to help them transform to help them get the completeness that they're going to need when Holy Spirit descends on them and gives them the power. It's one thing to have the power. It's another thing to have the literal belief system in place with the power. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of ministers that can deliver different things of power, but their belief system isn't strong enough to keep the attacks of the enemy from taking them down. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll say, how can the Holy Spirit flow through them like that? How can they have miracles and they can sing so beautifully or they can do so beautifully? But their belief system, which is where your soul is, your belief system, if it's not shored up like these 40 days the disciples were going through, when the power hits, it'll knock it out. Mm -hmm. And the enemy will come in. Every single time. Have you seen a movement where a major preacher or evangelist doesn't have that pressure coming in? What do you believe? Mm -hmm. So, in this case, <clears throat> what he's saying is, how do we get America to determine its path? You know, that's a pretty big, whoo ha okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I believe Jesus was trying to share with us in John 20, 23, when he says, what sins you forgive will be forgiven. What sins you retain will be retained. It's the understanding that I can't come and take your personal sin and repent for your personal sin and fix you with God. I can't do that. That's between you and God. But how many people do we know that they don't even recognize they have personal sin? Mm -hmm. They don't recognize that they're estranged from God. How many Christians do you know that say, you know, I don't have anything wrong with me. Okay, I'm fine. I, I go to church. I tithe. I do da-da-da-da-da. So there's nothing wrong with me. You see, <laughs> that is usually the result of a different kind of sin. It's the sin weight that comes on to all of us. All of us. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a geographical region. Because we have generational curses. Because we live in a certain country. Because we live in a certain family group. Because we live in a certain city. There are geographical bloodline curses, all these curses that really create like a weight or a barrier between that person and God. 
And that person does not even, is not even, cannot be aware of that sin. They are not aware of it. They don't see it. They don't recognize it. It means nothing to them. Okay. Because their soul is telling them they're okay. Okay. So when we say our instructions from Jesus is what sins you forgive will be forgiven. What sins you retain will be retained. He's not talking about this person's personal sin that they're going to have to work out. He's talking about they can't even be aware they are sinning because of this weight and barrier sin that is on them that is keeping their soul from hearing you're in sin. So all this weight and stuff around them is literally blocking. Just like your soul blocks your spirit. It is blocking them from hearing, seeing, feeling God. And that is one of the huge things in these next two years we're supposed to take care of. And that is removing the weight, the barriers, the sin off of these people so they can hear. And be convicted so they can see and be convicted so they can actually feel there is a God who loves me you know you've heard all the stories of the gang people and the cartel people and the Arab people and all the people that we think are just so evil and bad and all this mm -hmm. stuff and them coming to that moment where they realize God loves them somebody pray and removed all that weight, the weight of that sin, off of them mm -hmm. so they could have that aha moment. Okay? So as we look at what is the path he's trying to do, and how do we prepare for this? How, what is the path? I mean, if America's got two years to make it, hello, if you look mm -hmm. at it in the natural, we can't do enough in the natural. No. Okay? We can't. Okay. America is almost at the place where the destruction that has been done to her cannot be humanly fixed. So we've got to stop looking at how do I fix things in the natural? How do I look at things and get them stopped in the natural? And how do I move from being a natural worker to a spiritual worker? How do I do that? How do I get to that place? Well, one of the things I'd encourage you to do, especially these few weeks before Passover, because remember, by Passover 2026, it's a done deal. Let's just work with God and make sure we get the right deal. Okay, That's what I'm saying. So <clears throat> there's a book Chuck wrote called The Passover Prophecies, and he actually saw the plague coming. He actually saw it before uh, the coronavirus, before COVID. He saw what was happening. He saw what was going to do that. And he saw God began to t tell him and tell him about it. Well, 2020 or 2020 became um, the Passover decade. The number 80 is the word pay. Pay is, Passover is a pay word. Okay. And so what Father God showed Chuck was that in these, this decade, in these 10 years, these are the 10 years of Passovers. We've got to cross over. We've got to pass over into a different land. And it's not a one-time thing. It's like over and over and over and over again. The word where it came from, um, when Abram was with God, he called him <clears throat> Abram the Hebrew. Or the, the Hebrew word is Abram the Abar, A-B-A-R. Okay. And Abar literally means the one who crosses over. So the word Hebrew means the one who crosses over. That's what it's instructing and talking about. So when you look at it, for us to, anytime you and I align with the Abraham covenant, the Abraham covenant is teaching us to cross over. 
okay? When we align our hearts with Jesus, he's aligning us to his covenant of crossing over. So keep that in mind. When Holy Spirit's with us, he begins to align us <clears throat> to that next and highest place is that through Jesus, we can now align fully with Father God. There is in this season, please hear me, there is in this season an ability for you to align so much with Father God through Jesus, by Holy Spirit, that you can actually walk in the exact miracle working power Jesus did and you can walk in that same original design of Adam. Now, do you know how far we are from it? Do you know how far we are from it? But that's our promise. That's our alignment. That's our hope right there. If you can get to the place where you can see it. <clears throat> this pay decade, we've, we're now in 2024, so we've had four of those Passovers. But I want to read you a couple of things. This particular book, just so you'll know why it's, it's called The Passover Prophecies by Chuck Pierce. He said, <clears throat> I wrote this book because um, it was, there were critical issues that God had laid on my heart. And I want to frame the goals he's given to me for this book. This is simply a foretaste. Some of these principles may not make sense yet, but they will by the time we finish. The first one is, the church must understand that we have entered a new decade of war, the pay decade, wherein we need to hear God's voice and receive the favor of his hand to discern the critical years ahead. Two, Passover 2020 was prophetically significant as it propelled us into a new era for the church, an era where we will need to put on the full armor of God, like in Ephesians 6, mm -hmm. and remain under the covering of the blood of the Lamb, Yeshua. Positionally in the Spirit, we mark the doorways of our homes at Passover, just as the first Israelites did on that fateful night of the first Passover. And we step into our spheres of influence and authority. <clears throat> this is not just talking about a specific um, home. Okay, I want you to rethink that. Yes, you are marking your doorpost of your things you've been given ownership and stewardship of. Okay, so that is true. But he's wanting you to realize you as an entity have a region, a territory that when you mark the Passover blood on, that's what you're marking it over. What he's given you to steward, what he's given you to bring that, that's what you bring your spheres of influence and authority to. So don't limit yourself to saying, my Passover's just call it covering my family, us four, and no more. You know, Move it to the place where you have each been given different realms in which he wants you to touch. He wants you to have influence over. He wants you to have authority over. So when we do the blood of Jesus on these Passover things, that's what he's talking about. You put it on that door, that gate to your influence, that gate to your realm of authority, that gate to that place. Three, we must watch, listen, and move only when he tells us to move. That is so hard. Because we're like, Lord, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but there is a tsunami of evil come to America. Okay. And someone needs to put up some kind of dam or rock or something. Okay. Is that not how we think? Okay. But it's amazing that you have to shift when you do timing from your soul to your spirit. And you better hear this. Because a lot of Christians are responding out of their soul. Mm -hmm. And they're doing wrong timing because they can't imagine it's another timing than now. Mm -hmm. If I see it, I mean, I remember my first few years of being in Holy Spirit. If he gave me something, in my immaturity, I thought, well, let's go do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go do it now. I never thought to ask, when are we going to do this? 
In my mind, I thought if he's giving it to me, it must be now. This is where you have to shift the timing of God from your soul, who with those blocks and barriers will keep you from hearing the timing of God. Mm -hmm. And you say to yourself, I give permission to my spirit to be the one that sets the timing in my life with God. Not with news reports, not with accidents, not with this, not with fear, not with anything else. I, I cancel all that out. I will only respond to the timing of the Lord. Number four, the first seven years of pay this decade, and it'll go to, um, he was talking about 2019 to 2026, will involve critical campaigns in the war. There'll be critical times when we must do certain things. Giving the church an unprecedented window to move in fullness for the harvest of millions of souls. <clears throat> um, I, I felt this for so many years. I'd say, Lord, I'm not an evangelist. Okay, I just, I don't, I don't think like an evangelist. I don't, I don't want to go knock on doors. You know, I just, that, that was my idea of an evangelist. <clears throat> and when he said, the fivefold ministry is given to us to perfect the saints. So each one of them has a piece to give or to teach or to bring so that we have a balance. Because if you rely just on a pastor, you don't have the balance. If you rely on a teacher, you don't have the balance. If you rely on, so you have to learn how to integrate or receive the different pieces from all the others. <clears throat> so every time I would see harvest of souls, all I'm thinking about is going and doing the sinner's prayer with them. Okay, is that all correct? I don't know right. you guys think. Right. Okay, everybody's supposed to go and do the sinner's prayer with them. Well, we know that that is true, that God wants souls, but he specifically says, seek ye first the what? Kingdom. And all things will be added to you. He didn't say seek ye first winning souls. Please hear that. Because to win souls, most of the time, there has to be an atmospheric shift over that person or over that region so that person can remember or find out, I need God. So this is where we are. Sometimes you will realize that your point is when someone needs salvation, you can lead them to it. But your piece may be praying and removing the sin of all the people in your region so they can hear. You may not be the one that goes, leads them to the Lord. But you may very well be the one that removes the weight of this sin that's off of them. <clears throat> So they can hear. So when you hear about the harvest of millions or the fullness of it, realize that's what he's talking about. There will be campaigns. There will be windows. And what it will be is when the intercessors that have gone and spent time in the transfiguration place, gotten their instructions, can come back and say, oh, over this region, I say all the sin is forgiven. And they not only say it, they believe it. And when they believe it, God can come in and with that open heaven convict with the Holy Spirit and bring his love to all these people. And you could literally have awakening, arising, and revival in a day. Yes. See the difference? It's not you going out and knocking on everybody's doors. It's somebody's got to do the future work. The reason you're here today is because somebody did some serious praying for you. Somebody did. And they kept praying, and they kept praying, and they kept praying until you kept growing and growing and going and going. Okay? Number five, in both the physical and spirit realms, the front line of this war will manifest through economic as well as demonic power struggles. The realignment of national 
and geopolitical alliances. Now I could give you a whole dissertation on that. Mm -hmm. The overall fight for control of world systems. That's what's going to happen. Both in, this is the part you've got to get. Everybody's focusing on the physical realms right now. Mm -hmm. That's not where our focus is. Yes, we have to deal with that. But our focus is on the spirit realms. Because those control of world systems will be trade, finance, economics, influence, power, everything they can do to destroy it. The only thing that changes this is when we take the kingdom of God into those dimensions that are in the unseen realm and we take the enemy out and we say God is in control. God is in charge of this. Right now, in those dimensions, the enemy is wrecking havoc because he can rain down his will onto an evil group of people that are in agreement with him. And they are so convinced. This is the part I don't think we often understand. They're so convinced they're right. And I'll tell you why. Because the enemy wraps emotions up with it. Every child is taught in a school situation, you, they, give, they create this emotional response. Let me give you an example. You will never hear a school system say, we need to protect the babies, the unborn babies. You will never hear that. What you will hear is an emotional challenge to their direct system to say, you need to save the owls. You need to save the trees. You need to save the whales. You need to save the oppressed people. Do you hear me? And that's an emotional, it's when our whole education system shifted to emotional. And I can actually go back and we can show you when it happened. I mean, there's literal places where you can see they, it's not only you know facts, figures, learning, reading, writing, it's emotional. And that's what they've done. So that is a frequency. And that frequency comes from the unseen realm. So you can't expect all these people out here that don't know how to protect themselves, put the blood of Jesus up, or do anything, you can't expect them to get any protection from that frequency coming down and ministering to them. That's just wrong. What, why do you think they could do that? We're not even doing that. And we got all the tools. So we have to, that's when the love of Jesus shifts you. And you stop hating these stupid people <laughs> mm -hmm. that are doing all this stuff. And you realize if I'm advancing the kingdom of God, then I got to get my act together and I got to go up into that spirit realm, up into that high level place. And there I have to say, the name of Jesus is taking this over. And the sin is here is forgiven. And we are taking this. Key. These are the wars. Not, not here. You and I are not going to link up and go stand on a piece of land and fight for it in this season. We're going to link up in the spirit. Please hear me. There will be seasons where I will call in the Spirit and say, I need all my warriors to come and follow me. It will not be a natural call. It will be a spiritual call. And those that have the ability to get into that spirit realm will hear that call, and they will link up. And we will be able to go into those dimensions where the unseen is and say, ha, we're taking this out. That's the difference. <clears throat> Number six the United States is equally at critical crossroads, and the American church must be ready to let go of the old era, to surrender past glories and spoils of former wars. I cannot tell you the number of prayer groups and prayer organizations that are stuck in an old era. <clears throat> and they're stuck there because they had glory. They had success. They failed to remember a great principle and that is in Joshua and David and everybody else's time how do you want me to do this war mm -hmm. 
they just go do it the same way they did the last one. Mm -hmm. And you can't advance because that's what happened to Joshua when he didn't listen and he didn't ask. This is where we are. And it's op and open its hand to receive the new revelation that is fresh for a new warring season. They can't receive the new revelation because there's blocks and barriers, religious things, all these things that are on them. Whose job is it to take them off? <clears throat> Us. Okay. Number seven. As we tighten our belts and adjust our spending, the Spirit of God will make us stronger and stronger. As Daniel said, we will learn to do exploits. We will take resources and cause them to multiply in new ways. <clears throat> this is the thing. The miracles that Jesus did were not done for show. He does say in several places it's to show you my father sent me. But it was also to demonstrate to these disciples first and then everybody else next is, you know, there's food you don't know about. There's a source of water you don't know about. There's a source of power you don't know about. And you've got to learn to tap into that because when your natural food isn't there, you can pull down the food from me. If he can manifest fish, mm -hmm. he can manifest food. Right. See, we don't think like that. Mm -hmm. We don't think. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be prepared for natural disasters or all those things. That's just common sense. But to the place where you panic and stockpile for 20 years, mm -hmm. okay, let me ask you this. If you are walking where Jesus is, he and the angels would provide that meal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't get there because there are barriers in your soul that say, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. And we can't walk into the spirit. <clears throat> so let me give you a couple of, couple of ideas. One of the things is that you've got to realize what your imagination is and why it's so important. Um, Isaiah 26 has a wonderful phrase in the Passion Translation. It says in verse 3, whose imaginations are consumed with you. Okay. It's talking about the people. It's talking about their imaginations and that their imaginations are consumed with Father God. Okay. So listen. The word imagination is yester, Y-E-S-T-E-R. And it means form concept, framework, imagination, and mind. So the human imagination is wholly owned by Holy Spirit. Is one of the most, when it is wholly owned by the human, by Holy Spirit, it's one of the most powerful redemptive forces on earth. We know that literally every atom, whether you realize it or not, is sitting there watching you watching us because we are the children of the one that created the Adam. Mm. And they are sitting there watching you to see what you want it to be. Please hear me. Every Adam. What does this child of God want us to be? <clears throat> and whatever you say it's going to be, that's what it becomes. That's why when you pray, you are moving things from a conceptual imagination of Father, that this is what Father wants. You are moving it as that kingdom to earth. So it manifests from the unseen to the seen. Okay? That's why it's so important. So our imaginations will create new frameworks and conceptualizations of the problems around us. In other words, when you see the problem, our natural mind goes, I mean, I am a problem solver, okay, people? This is why they called me, and this is why I got the big bucks, okay? Because <clears throat> everybody else would go, oh, it can't be done. And something in me, it was like a red flag in front of a bull or something, I don't know. But something in me would say, well, let's see if Father wants it done. And if I could get a word that Father wanted it done, I would attack the problem. 
But the difference was I continually asked God, what are we doing about this? And the innate skill set in me knew how to solve a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to demonstrate how he would solve the problems. So often it'd be the direct opposite of how I would fix this problem. And he'd say, no, don't talk about that. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. And I'm like, I don't see how any of this is relevant. And he'd say, well, that's because you're up down there and I'm up here. You're not coming close enough. And so when I would do what he said to do in his timing, invariably, almost every single time, that problem would slowly start to unravel. And that's what he's trying to say. This imagination that you have, think of it like this. We must gather raw materials, then shape them into the form and the identity for our future. Our concepts, frameworks, minds, and imaginations must unlock new forms and identities to meet and triumph over this era ahead. Big deal, guys. Big deal. So, I want to give you an example that's in the scripture to help you understand We all know the story of Mary and Martha, and it's in Luke 10, and I want to read it to you really fast. Luke 10, chapter 38. And Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, and then they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master absorbing, you may want to underline this stuff, absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated with finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guest. So she interrupted Jesus and said, now now I want you to get the picture here. Jesus and his disciples come into Martha and Mary's home. This is also Lazarus' home. They come into this home. And Martha's thinking, okay, I've got all these extra people. I've got to have food. I've got to clean the house. I've got to get them some refreshments. This is what you do. This is how you serve, right? Mary's like, (sighs) okay. So Martha interrupts Jesus saying, Lord, now she didn't go tell Mary this. She didn't go to Mary and go, Mary, I need your help. Think Think of what she did. She wanted the Lord to rebuke Mary. Mm-hmm. You might think about that because there's a lot of people you want the Lord to rebuke. <coughs> Just throwing it out there. Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. Wow, that's pretty bold. (laughs) The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha. He loved Martha too. There are a lot of Christians this falls into. Mm -hmm. Hear me. He said, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled? Pulled away by these many distractions. Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted. Uh huh. And I won't take this privilege from her. <clears throat> For the season you're about to enter, <laughs> you will feel the pressure and the need to be a Martha. Because you've always served like this. You've always taken care of something like this. You've always done a house like this. Martha was saying, the Lord is in my house. I need to serve him. I need to fix him natural things. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. I need to fix him natural food and a natural bed and clean his house. I need to do the natural things. She was annoyed and frustrated because her very sister in Christ didn't come help her. I'm putting this in perspective of what you're going to come up against. Okay, They're going to say, 
why aren't you helping us prepare the natural things? Why aren't you doing the natural things? And it's because Mary was not about to miss the moment. She wasn't going to miss this moment. She wasn't concerned with other people. She wasn't concerned with preparing the food. She wasn't concerned about whether the house was clean or not. <coughs> you know, I want to I put that. If just a group of people showed up at your house today, <laughs> and it was the Lord Jesus himself, <laughs> okay, would you naturally think, oh my goodness, I need to do this. I don't think I cleaned the toilet. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The dust is everywhere. I don't even think I have enough food. What am I going to do? They just showed up. <coughs> she wasn't worried or troubled about anything. Mary wasn't. She was in her perfect place. Because when this stuff happens, and this was just a good visit. This wasn't a war. Hear me. This was just peaceful, nice, well, let's go visit. Okay. Can you get distracted, peaceful, nice, well, let's go visit? From missing it. There was only one thing on her mind. <clears throat> only one focus. And that's the path you're going to have to get to understand. To go through these challenging times of these next two years, you cannot let the things of this world distract you. You cannot let them come in. Now, I'm not saying don't clean your house, okay? I'm not saying don't dust. I'm not saying don't clean the toilet. I'm not saying don't prepare food for your people. Okay, do you hear what I'm saying? But, and if you do do that, hire somebody. <coughs> but Jesus was her master and her Lord. The, both of those women were preparing for something. Both of them. Okay. Martha believed she was doing what was necessary to properly serve Jesus and his disciples. This is where you'll get tripped up. Mm -hmm. This is where you're going to make a mistake. Because especially if, if what you have been trained is to serve in the natural. To serve in your church. To serve in this situation. <clears throat> Those things are important. We have to do them. But there are times when only one thing is needed. And that's not to be distracted. It's to sit with Jesus. Okay. And you have to tell yourself, I can't think of this right now. Jesus is calling me into this moment so he can give me instructions. And if he can turn water into wine, he can turn dust into nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to be concerned about what people think my house looks like. God says we've got to prepare our hearts especially. That's what I'm saying. Strengthening our spirits with our imagination and letting Holy Spirit. There are things in your heart that are acting as blocks and barriers that keep your imagination from being triggered. And in my case, I was always told imagination was fantasy. Okay, remember that. Imagination to me was fantasy. It was like, you know, the, the Disney cartoons you see and, the, you know, all these things. And we knew Santa wasn't this, but it was just fantasy. Okay. I can remember when I tried to explain Halloween to my mother, she goes, that's just make-believe. That's not really true. And I'm like, okay. There's, see, I didn't know at that time I needed to remove the stuff off of her. Okay. And so in her mind, she was totally convinced it was all harmless. It was all nothing. It was just make-believe. Imagination is not that. Imagination is your God-given ability to see into the spirit realm and see what God sees. That's why even, and I've shared this with you before, that's why we had a friend that was an alcoholic. He was a Native American, and he was an alcoholic, one of the greatest artists I've ever seen. And he said, I can't do my art if I'm not 
in that state. If he didn't have his alcoholic mind, it's because the enemy had removed a legal barrier from, from him being able to access heaven. So when he was in that alcoholic state, he could see the things in the spirit realm. He could see them. He could see the beauty. He could see the glory. And he was able to create. He was doing it illegally because he had to use alcohol. And what we tried to convince him is, you have that same ability and God-given right without it. You just use Jesus. But his soul was so overwhelmed, he could not. So that imagination is for you to be able to hear and see in the spirit realm what God is doing, what he wants to do, what he wants to create, what he wants you to bring to earth, all of that, to be able to do that. <clears throat> so in this season, we're going to find it harder and harder to just take time out and sit with him. You're going to find it harder and harder to keep your brain and your spirit peace. <laughs> Okay, because you're going to see disasters, you're going to see uh, rumors of wars and wars, you're going to see all this. It must get to a place where you say in your heart, uh-uh, 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 I choose Mary. I choose to just focus in on this moment and stay focused in on whatever my Holy Spirit and Jesus are telling me to do. Because if I start looking out here, I'll see them coming to the house. I'll see the war, I'll see the thing. And he wants me to be in such a state of belief that when I look out and see them, they don't get to do what they want to do to me. They don't get to bring fear. They don't get to bring anxiety. They don't get to distract me and pull my focus off what my assignment is for this war. We know that we've got to have weapons and our weapons of warfare have to be in place. So we have to get to that place, but we've got so many weapons. We've got intercession. Do you know being in a state of peace or shalom is a weapon? Be, being able to stay right, stay whoa, right here. Okay, that is a weapon against the enemy. Because if they can't rattle you, if they can't make you shift, what ends up happening is you shift them. You see, the whole purpose is for us to affect things, not things to affect us. That's the goal. And so we have, that's another weapon, is that being in peace. Praying in the Spirit, decreeing His Word, having the power of agreement. And sometimes I remind my soul, everything in you that's not in agreement with God, I now put duct tape on your mouth. Okay, now, you all can use whatever method you want, but if you can't be nice, I'm sending you to your room. Okay, just shut that door and you're not allowed to talk because they will voice these things. Again, we're not fighting for victory. Please write these words down. We are not fighting for victory. We're not. That's the mindset way too many people have. What we're doing is we're fighting from a place of victory. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. When you fight in the natural, you're fighting for victory. When you come up into the spirit realm, the victory is already done. So you're fighting from a place of, we've already won. Mm -hmm. You know, people look at America and go, uh, I'm not seeing that. It ain't ever going to happen. If you come up here, you can see what God's will is for America. And you can see what he's already done and he wants to do for America. And so you're fighting from a place of victory. Totally different. Totally different. That's where we fight the good fight of faith, from that place. <clears throat> um, there's so much more I want to share with you. I would probably encourage you to read Psalms 119, because uh, this is the decade of pay, and in Psalms 119, every section is a Hebrew word. 
Okay. And the Hebrew word for pay is Psalms 119, 129 through 136. So you might read that to just get it in your spirit. This is the pay. This is where I am. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. And this is the month of Nisan, the first of the months, though it's the first of the first. Okay. Mm -hmm. And its Hebrew word is hey. Okay. And in Psalms 119, that section is verse 33 through 40. So I just encourage you to read those because it'll help you understand we're in this decade, but we're in this month of breath, of life, of doing it. <clears throat> so I want to read this last, it's a word from Chuck, and it's a word to release the anointing of God's spirit. <clears throat> so this is his last word or prayer in this book to just help you understand where we're going. So just receive this as I'm reading this um, and speak to your soul and say, soul, any barriers or blocks that keep me from hearing the spiritual words in this release, I hereby bind in the name of Jesus, and I command you to be gone. I ask for forgiveness, Lord, for even allowing them to be in me, known or unknown. Anything in me that is blocking me from walking into this greater revelation of how to live and fight and be in the spirit realm for this decade. <clears throat> this is a day that I am visiting my people. This will be a decade when I align the host of heaven with the armies of earth. You are entering a season to walk in an Issachar anointing. In your process of time, you are ending and beginning. I am declaring that you will end seasons strong and begin new seasons stronger. I am aligning heaven's gates with earth's gates. I am declaring you will be at the right place at the right time. My word is coming alive in a new way. Receive the spirit of revelation and an anointing to interpret every step you take in the days ahead. There is a great war between death and life in the earth realm. Stay one step ahead of death. Watch carefully, for I am unfolding and revealing dimensions of time that have been closed in past seasons. I am creating a winning team in the earth. Many of you signed up for my team, but you didn't want the discipline to become what I needed in the last hour of history. However, in this hour of history, I will draw you forth. Do not despise my disciplines. I am creating a winning team that will know how to pass the ball work together, and triumph in the end. This is the beginning of a triumphant movement throughout the earth. And I say, my team will win. The power of Satan's accusing, condemning, and confining strategies will be overcome by this triumphant people. Your promises are beginning to manifest around you New levels of prophecy for your future are starting to bud in your atmosphere. Remove any past judgment that has caused you to hold captive your future. My people, know that your times are in my hands. The anointing breaks the yoke. Let me anoint you new and fresh for the era ahead. <clears throat> One of my things that I would share with you today in closing is I know that my assignment is to create the understanding via Holy Spirit that the sins are forgiven. To get it out to spirit-filled people all over the world that know how to pray. And to help them understand if we do something as simple as 
say over a house, a person, an organization, a region, the sin is forgiven off of this. The blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus is applied and the sin is forgiven so that God can bring his atmosphere and touch the people, the organizations, the governments, all those things in his time. We don't know all of his plans, but we know that he's got to have the junk frequencies out of the way before he can come. Out of the way. And so in this season of you getting prepared and getting yourself where you're supposed to be, <clears throat> I would just remind you, there will be moments in time when he will say to you, I need you to focus like Mary. I need you to focus really hard right now on me. And don't be distracted by all the things that want to come and steal your things. And uh, that's hard for those of us that have structure and have all these things in our, it's really hard. But um, he didn't condemn Martha. He even called her his beloved. But he was basically saying, I'm not going to take this away from her. Because he realized that if we focus in the natural, we'll miss the spiritual. And so I'm just encouraging us all to do that. So Father, we close this session and this time. Uh, we thank you, Father God, that you're giving us your wisdom, your revelation. We thank you that you're exposing what we think our soul has been doing so right. And we just lay our souls on the altar once again. And we say, Father, our soul is so strong sometimes, uh, quoting the word to us and doing those things. But Father, if there's anything in our souls that opposes the will of the Most High King, anything, we just ask that you expose it to us and give us the steps, give us the understanding on how to remove the sin from that. Help us to understand how do we get our whole human to be led by the spirit that is in us? How do we get that spirit to take command, to take authority? How do we relinquish that in our souls when we've been so heavily doing our Christianity in our soul? Father, our souls aren't intrinsically evil from that. You created them. You helped design this so our parents would do that. But Father, we say today, we choose to hear your thoughts. We choose to have your imagination. We choose to fight this upcoming and current battle and war your way. And to do that, we're going to have to come out of some of this soul realm thinking and this natural thinking and move to a higher level. I look around, Father, and I see so many that are already in your spirit realm, in your presence. And I think, if their soul ever got completely redeemed, what on earth would they be like? And I remember you said to me, they wouldn't be on earth. Hmm. They'd be in my spirit. They would just manifest my spirit through their earthly body to the place that when people even walk into the room with them, they would fall down from the power of God. That's our legacy. So Father, just forgive us for our stubbornness, our rebellious nature, our religious spirits, our wrong mindsets, our intellectual things, our everything we've put in place that protective peace that unbeknownst to us is literally protecting us from our spirit. We ask for forgiveness and ask that it be removed and just cannot function. And we give you the praise because we do trust you. And when we trust you, you help us to trust others. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Questions? Thoughts?
Well, that was pretty simple. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. I was liking that reminder of doing things in the timing of God because one, and only one aspect of that is our perspective shifts when we wait on his timing. Because a lot of times when he shows us just enough that we're excited, but for just enough that we or the flip side when we're not redeemed enough and we see just enough that we're like oh this is urgent we got to do something you know take action right now because that's when we're in that desperate place or the excitement is where we're in that unprepared place and so it really there's a process and a journey yes for that <coughs> time so i think that's just one of the facets <laughs> of a good facet. not just jumping in because yeah. it's like oh yay yeah well, sometimes in the midst of chaos, I get so excited when I see something, you know, like that, that I just focus on it so much I forget. Wait a minute, <laughs> you know, it's not the all the answer. That's where we need to ponder on it. So I hear you. I'm guilty myself. But yes. Anybody else? Questions? Thoughts? Well, I guess I'll add my little your piece of what's going Please, on. Please, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Father God is. Because he has not let me come here, he's making me grow through Holy Spirit. Uh huh. Amen. And he told me <laughs> the other morning in prayer. Um, it's, it was before Resurrection Day. Okay. And I thought Passover was the Friday before. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and then I was reading where Saul didn't obey God. Mm hmm. And God just cut him off. Mm -hmm. And he told me that I was supposed to form a team. He showed me who the team was supposed to be and cleanse the church grounds, cleanse the church, and cleanse the atmosphere. All of this, lay the boundaries. Mm -hmm. He said before Passover. Mm -hmm. Well, I hit resistance. I thought, I'm being a soul. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, long story short, I went to the people that God had assigned to help me with this. I said, he told me to do this before Passover, and here it is, Resurrection Sunday. I and missed you missed it. it. <laughs> and he's going to withdraw his spirit from me. I was panicked. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and each one of them said, are you waiting for God's Mm -hmm. I said, well, I thought I was. Mm -hmm. In my natural, my soul was saying, Passover. Passover was, has to be with, yeah, yeah, what they tell you Resurrection Day is. Well, yeah. anyway, <laughs> last year it was, but not this year. Some years it is. Yeah. 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 So Passover's coming. Yeah. You have not missed it. You have not missed it. And Resurrection Day is coming. Yes. It was not then. You have not missed it. <laughs> no. And that's hard. That's hard for us to shift that. You know. So. But if millions of people celebrate the Resurrection Day, I, I'm thrilled they do. Okay. Absolutely. I am not unthrilled about that at all. I just don't want them to have a mixture. And that's what the enemy can do to us when we get out of the timing is it creates that mixture in us. I pray for the freedom that purity brings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's good. The thing that ha happens a lot uh, to me is, or that I've learned through the years is sometimes when we're presented with a, a prayer need or whatever, we go into automatic mode of this, this pray, let's pray this way, this way. This is how we pray. You know, even pulling the word into it. Yeah, yeah. Instead of listening for Holy Spirit to say, now what? What is, how, are we, how are we supposed to pray in this situation? Mm -hmm. And I've just learned a lot through that, just to wait and just to say, you know, because God knows all of it, and it may look like we're supposed to pray a certain way because that's the automatic push that button, you know, the easy button. That's so true. <laughs> push that button because that's the way we ought to pray. And then, of course, praying in the Spirit is huge too. A lot of times I'll do that before I go into the next mode. But, of Holy Spirit, what do you want us to do here? And I just think that 
you know, that's an, a stumbling block a lot of times to our answers because we just go into this thing and we got to pray this way, and, you know, so. That's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's because we had results. You know, so we think we have to pray that way. Right. That's so true. But that's a good example. And maybe it's worked in the past. Yes. Yes. I mean, it has <laughs> certain times it's worked and we got to go, we got to pray the word, we got to do this. And instead of listening even what to pray, you know, how do we pray about this Holy Spirit? You know what this mm -hmm. situation is. And it may not be anything like what we think in our soul area. That's where the soul area sometimes Messes. becomes a block. I agree. Okay. That's so true. And in my case, in the past, same thing. You know, I would think, well, I got results yeah. praying this for this situation. Right. I'll do it again because that'll get results. You know, I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't get results because <laughs> it worked. Okay. And I just didn't have that other piece in, like ask, like you're saying. You know, ask him. Yeah. Is this it? Because the few times that I did ask in the beginning... And he gave me such bizarre things, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that can't work. And you've had people come up to you and say, will you pray this, such and such. They'll say, will you pray that somebody, you know, gets saved, this person yeah. gets saved, or this. And you think, well, I, you know, I mean, I've always had to just listen, Lord, <laughs> how do you want me to pray about this? Because, you yeah. know, and, and it may, I know one time, some lady told me, will you pray that this, my fiance gets saved before we get married, and. And I just had a check, check, not now, you know, I yeah. just don't do this right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I prayed that their hearts would both be right in the mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit just gave me the right. The words to say. Yeah, without to. Uh, Offending. Yeah. <laughs> well, Are you even, sure you want to get married? Yeah, really. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I usually say really things like, I can agree with what God wants. Yes, yes, there you go. And when I say that, you know, like, oh, okay, let's agree with what God wants. And then I'm like, it's probably not what you want, but <laughs> we're agreeing with what God wants. So let's just agree with what God wants Most to do important. in this. We know that God wants all, sh sh none should perish. We know exactly. that. Yeah. However, God may, Holy Spirit may want to do it a different way than what we, you know, mm -hmm. we think, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying. I think when, in my mind, when I remove you know, like the blocks to healing or the blocks to salvation or when I remove that sin weight from them, then Holy Spirit gets to bring his perfect will and timing into that. But I've missed it a lot of times because, you know, you've sat in front of everybody and you know it's Holy Spirit and you're pouring your heart out and you're trying to do something for them and it's like you are talking to a wall. You know, and you're just like... <laughs> I know I heard Holy Spirit. I know I'm supposed to do this. Okay, but we forgot that step mm -hmm. in John 20, 23. Mm -hmm. Remove the sin. Remove the barriers. Remove the blocks that are affecting their soul and their spirit so they can't even hear. Disarm the soul. Disarm it. Change it. Take that atmosphere back. And then what you were supposed to do will be absolutely right and you can have the fruits of it. I think we were sent right on that time, but we didn't do that step, and so they can't receive it because we didn't remove that from them. Clanging symbols. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. I have one question that's come up. Okay. Well, it's not real. I need to know if, if this is correct in what I think I heard from God. Okay. Um, I was studying the Word one morning, and... I was not understanding. And I I said, Holy Spirit, you're supposed to be my teacher. Why why won't you show this to me? There's got to be something else because what I'm seeing is not who you are. So I'm missing something. Why aren't you showing me? And he took me back to the children of Israel in the desert when God sent the manna. And they were only supposed to receive for that day Correct. what they needed for that day, mm -hmm. nothing more. Mm -hmm. And he said, when you need it, I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. He said, if they took more manna than they needed, 
it just it get maggoty and wormy and nasty. Mm -hmm. He said, you'll just forget. So why have it before you need it? I'll give it to you when you need it. Well, that's a lot of trust in you. So <laughs> that, that's what I thought, that, mm -hmm. that it, would, it has to increase my faith. But it does increase. Okay. Our, yeah, faith, our, our, our faith grows. So you get a measure, okay. but that measure is like uh, the ability to grow. It's like a leavening, actually. There's leavening that's evil and leavening that's good. So the leavening of God makes things grow. The leavening of evil makes them grow evil. So that measure of faith is designed to give to you the part you need right now and as he gives you experiences and your faith you fight the battle with faith right. it's all about trust and so if he gave you all of it it wouldn't require any trust or faith yeah. so to get from this step to this step to this step to increase our faith we have to be in those areas where we don't know all the things you see if I knew what was going to happen in a battle I'm ahead Okay, if I knew everything and my faith um, had not grown to do that, she's got to go. If my faith had not grown to, to go that place, then that battle's designed to grow my faith. So if he gave me all that faith or all that knowledge beforehand, if you know something, it literally, you don't need faith. If you see something, you don't need faith to see it because you've already that's seen. That's what I was seeing. Yeah, and you already have faith. To, if you already have all that, you don't need the faith to make it happen. So it's not like I'm being evil, mm -mm. and therefore I can't see. No. And it's not like the sin slimes on me, and no. I can't see. No. It's a, I don't need it yet. Yeah, it's He'll because it he's me, he's I got need. a journey for everybody. And if we do our journeys, that's how he increases our faith. So the tests and the trials, experiences, mm -hmm. those are the things that hone us. Those are the things that strengthen us and give us the ability to say, I overcame this, I got another measure of faith. My faith is growing. So that as you do each of those experiences, your faith grows because you see him come through. You see him and you see what he was trying to get you to see. But remember, if we already, I mean, when you go up and sit with Jesus even, he's not going to show you everything. He's not going to show you everything that is ever going to happen to you. He may show bits and pieces. But if your faith is not there to handle those things, okay, he's not going to show it to you because he wants your faith to grow so that you can do that. So sitting with him is almost like, he says, go into this battle, and we'll say, am I going to win? He goes, I didn't say it's that. It's not your problem. Go into the battle. Yeah. And so I'm like, but I really want to know if I'm going to win. Why am I doing this battle if I don't win? But it may be the very test that I have to do to grow my faith, to believe in him, to get me through the battle, and that the other side I realize I won because I did what he said to do. I was obedient. I didn't won because of success victory or something like that. So no, I think he does that. I think he's just helping you understand you're not going to have all the wisdom of everything. If he gave that to you and your belief system wasn't there, what would happen? <laughs> so I think faith is the currency that we use to help grow us to where we need to be because it's accepting things and operating things we can't understand or we don't see. And when we do that, you know, it's the substance. Faith is the substance of things unseen. Okay, if you could take that into physics, in the spirit realm are these substances. Okay, think of them like building blocks. So every time you need something, you literally can take one of those substance building blocks and move it from heaven to earth and it becomes what you need. That's the whole premise. So he's saying 
that you have all this supply, all this provision, all these resources that are right here in the unseen realm. In looking in the natural, you don't see any of them. But if you can realize you have authority and you have legal right to go up and get one of those building blocks that has not necessarily even been labeled, but by faith, you say, this is his resources, this is his power, this is his supply, this is what he's bringing, and you bring that from the unseen realm into the seen realm, it becomes by faith, just like the miracles of Jesus, exactly what he told it to be. Just like the manna. Just like the manna. Because it was invisible. Right. It was there all along in the unseen. Right. But, but he Moses would drop had to call it them. That's right. And the provision was to be in such a way that on the normal days of the week, you could only get one slot. On the day before Sabbath, you had to take two. Now, if it didn't work on the other days, why did it work on Sabbath? The day before Sabbath. Because he didn't want them doing things. on. He wanted them totally relying on him and totally trusting. So it even took faith to believe, well, I can collect two things now. And they're not going to mold, even though on every other day they do. But on this day, they're going to last for two. See, it's moving us from the physics and laws of the natural to the physics and laws of the spiritual. And that's big.